Welcome to the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Welcome everyone. I think someone who absolutely does not need an introduction to this group is Dr. John Scott. For the sake of the recording or anyone who's new, Dr. Scott leads Hep C ECHO and is director of telehealth and telemedicine here at the U and is an associate professor and one of our experts in viral hepatitis. And John, thank you for doing this. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Brian. So today I'm going to give an overview of this newly approved anti viral called Epclusa. It's a combination pill of sofosbuvir and valpatosvir. And before I do that, I just want to take you guys through some of the necessary disclosures. And so my objectives in the next 15 minutes are just make sure you understand the, the prescribing information, including some of the efficacy, side effects, and a couple drug-drug interactions, particularly with HIV antivirals that you need to be aware of. So Epclusa was FDA approved a month to the day. It was approved on June 28th of 2016 for chronic hepatitis C in all genotypes. So genotypes one through six this is the first truly pan-genotypic antiviral. So that's kind of a groundbreaking step in the forward of antiviral treatment for hep C. And it's a combination of two pills. So sofosbuvir, I think a lot of you know about. That's a polymerase inhibitor. And then this, the new drug is valpatosvir. It's an NS5A inhibitor. Structurally and target-wise, very similar to the other combination that was part of Harvoni. So it's still the same target there. And the one thing I just want to say is that it's approved for hep C, but they don't specifically call out whether HIV-positive patients can be on this. So some of the other antivirals for hep C, they are actually do have a little section saying that it's approved for HIV, but I don't think it should be an issue. And it's approved for both treatment-naive, treatment experience, cirrhotics, non cirrhotics so a broad range. So the dosing and duration of therapy is pretty easy. So if you have a patient who's got compensated cirrhosis or below, regardless of treatment status, you just give this one pill once a day, Apclusa, for 12 weeks. If you've got a decompensated cirrhotic patient, a class B or C, then just add ribavirin. It's still for 12 weeks. And you can take it with or without food. I think the one kind of caution for everyone is that because of the sofosbuvir component, you cannot use this in patients who have renal failure. And the package insert says creatinine clearance less than 60 mLs per minute you shouldn't use. In practice, we go down to 30 mLs, but just wanted to make sure you're aware of what the package insert says. So moving on to the success rate, we use something called the SVR12, stands for S Sustained Viral Response at 12 weeks. And it really, the way I explain that to patients is this is a cure because we know long term these people remain viral negative. And, you know, pretty hard to argue with this. 99% really across the board, whether you're talking about a cirrhotic or non cirrhotic, treatment naive, treatment experienced. And actually, a lot of the people who didn't respond, they were lost to follow up. So there are very few actual viral failures in this. The, the other study that was done as part of the phase three program was in gene type threes. And if there's like one still chink in the armor for sofosbuvir and valpatosvir, it is in the genotype three patients. So instead of that 99% we saw with all the other genotypes, this one is 95%. But it is statistically significantly superior to soft ribavirin for genotype three. So you can see 95% versus 80%. And just to break it down a little bit more in terms of what happened with those patients, you can see there were 11 relapses and two were, I think, lost to follow up, whereas there were way more relapses in the soft ribo group. So, you know, sometimes you, you, you want to drill down a little bit more on those gene type 3 patients and ask, well, what, what was it about those patients that led them to, to not do so well? So this is a post hoc analysis that was presented at the European liver meeting several months ago, and they looked at certain factors in having cirrhosis, having a low platelet count, less, less than 100,000, albumin less than 3.5, fiber scan consistent with cirrhosis, treatment experience, and having NS5A resistance, all those kind of lowered your response rates, you know, on average around 5 to 10 percent. So what you can do is actually aggregate all those risk factors that were on that last slide and until you get around three of those factors, you really don't see much of a decrement in the SVR rate. So at two factors, still getting 95%, just one, 97%. But when, when you get down to three, that's when the drop off, and then we just not a whole lot of numbers for, for four factors or below. So what do you do with a genotype three patient who's maybe treatment experience or has cirrhosis? And this is where going back to maybe some of the phase two studies that were done in this area is helpful. This was a 
phase two study that hasn't been published yet. It was just presented at the American Liver Meeting almost two years ago in a small number, so 25 patients in each of four arms. So this is patients who got valpatosphere with a lower dosage and then the lower dosage plus ribavirin and then the higher dosage, which actually was approved, the 100 milligram dosage, and then adding ribavirin. And what you can see is that adding ribavirin for these patients really started to help out, especially when you had the, the higher dosage of valpatosphere and you had ribavirin, you're getting close to that 96% level. But again, small numbers, so your error bars are going to be large. So what about co-infected patients? This was a study that was done, and it's called Astral 5. And just to cut to the chase, you can see that the cure rates were still in the mid to high 90s, with the, the genotype 3 is around 92% but not a huge number like we saw with HIV negative patients. And then if you start to look at why these people failed, you can see that the relapses actually were in the 1A group with most of the people either being lost to follow-up or withdrawing their consent. So what about side effects? Pretty similar to what we saw with Harvoni with headache and fatigue kind of leading the way. Some of the GI side effects like nausea. We've been seeing a little bit more diarrhea with our Harvoni patients, so kind of keep an eye out for that. And then insomnia. The only one that really seemed to have a statistical significance was with asthenia, which is a little bit more with Epclusa com compared to placebo. And then there, was, there were some signals for elevated lipase and creatinine kinase and things like that that really didn't seem to bear out when they uh, did statistical analysis. So you don't really need to do monitoring for those labs. So next, what about drug-drug interactions? And probably the most important point I want to make about Epclusa is that it is very sensitive to having a normal pH in the stomach for maximal absorption. It's much, much more brittle compared to Harvoni. Harvoni is a little bit more flexible for patients taking some of the antacids. So I guess the take home point is if you have a patient who's on a proton pump inhibitor or H2 blocker, if you can get them off, that would be really helpful because you can see that the valpatosphere levels go down quite a bit. There are some recommendations for how to dose them but in general, what we're trying to do practically is to really try to get the patients off if they can. The other medications you should know about, amiodarone and sofosbuvir is a kind of a no-no. You can get the symptomatic bradycardia. The digoxin, if you're on patients on that, can go up. And then some of the rifamycins also are not so great in St. John's wort. What about HIV antivirals? The two drugs you should probably avoid are efavirenz, and I think rilpivirine is also another one. So that class should be avoided. Tenofovir, you can use, but just have to use it with a little bit of caution because the valpatosphere and tenofovir interact so that your levels of tenofovir increase and you can get some of the renal toxicities or Fanconi syndrome for that. I know a lot, very few of you used it. Topranovir, probably shouldn't use that as well. The two statins, rosuvastatin and torvastatin, either go down to the, the lowest dose possible or, or switch to a different statin. So really, I think there's quite a bit of excitement about Epclusa. It's the first pangenotypic antiviral. It is $20,000 cheaper than Harvoni, which is another kind of nice aspect of that medication. It's approved for cirrhotic patients, including decompensated cirrhotics, pretty well tolerated. And I guess the main thing is just to watch out for acid suppressants in these patients. And with that, I'll open up for questions.